The lands of Eastern Europe have long been at the forefront of war. It is here, during the medieval era, that the Rus principalities stood valiantly against assaults from the north, south, east and west, against Viking, Byzantine, Crusader and Mongol alike. Leading them into battle would be the armoured fist of the Drugina. Today, let us explore the history of these elite knights from the Rus domains. It's always worth examining modern events through the lens of history. Though things may not always repeat themselves, they often rhyme. You can get a good sense of these historical rhythms through our sponsor Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that puts the vast library of human history at your fingertips. What's more, it takes thousands of nonfiction books and uses experts to distill them down to the most essential ideas for you to easily digest with just text or audio in 15 minutes. It's been a great tool for me to explore a wide range of topics from the 27 sections offered by Blinkist. As a great example, I was recently able to listen to Bloodlands by Timothy Snyder, which tells the tragic story of how Eastern Europe was caught in the crossfire of Germany and the Soviet Union in their Great War. I followed that up with The Sleepwalkers by Christopher Clark, which further delves into the intricate international relations which have long played a role in this region of the world throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. I'm sure that when you try Blinkist, you'll be able to explore many hidden gems of your own. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. So click the link in my description to start your 7-day free trial with Blinkist and get 25% off a premium membership. Enjoy! To understand the origins of the Drugina, we must first come to know the lands from which they emerged. These were the vast domains of Eastern Europe. They are bounded to the north by the Baltic Sea and to the south by the Black Sea. To the west lie the Carpathian Mountains and to the far east lie the Urals. Within these natural borders extends the Great Sarmatic Plain whose roughly 4 million square kilometers are filled with vast prairies and forests. Its relatively flat features are given character by several upland regions as well as numerous river valleys and basins which gradually drain to the north or south. In terms of natural resources, it is rich with wild game, fish, timber, peat, copper, iron and silver. Inhabiting these lands were a variety of people who lived largely nomadic lives. For instance, during antiquity, many of the inland regions were dominated by steppe tribes such as the Sumerians, Scythians and Sarmatians. Neighbouring the horse lords were others who lived more sedentary lives along the rivers and shores. Over the centuries, they would be mixed by migration, intermarriage and conflict. This was especially true during the period of Great Migrations in late antiquity, which saw the movement of many peoples across the region. One of the major ethno-linguistic groups which came to occupy the lands of Eastern Europe at this time would be the Slavs. By the 7th century, they had split into multiple linguistic branches and each regional group began to consolidate its own power within the context of their particular ecosystem. For the most part, their various population centres were quite spread out with a common model of development involving the construction of walled, wooden cities built atop defensive terrain, from which the local elite and their followers could establish control over the surrounding regions. This influence could be further extended by tapping into the major rivers through which men and goods could flow more steadily. But they were not the only ones to recognize this. Many Northmen from the Baltic and Scandinavian regions made their way south across the great rivers to trade, raid and seek fortune. These would slowly mix with the local Slavic and steppe tribes of the region. According to the 12th century records of the Primary Chronicle, the foreign Varangians were even invited to become overlords. Much academic debate surrounds this topic and the issue is far from settled. However, what is clear is that either by conquest, diplomacy or gradual integration, the two would merge around the 9th century AD to become the group we now refer to as the Rus. But again, we must remember that such labels are modern conveniences which would have meant little to the people at the time. 
Returning to the legendary founding of the Rus, the primary chronicle claims that around 860 AD, a Scandinavian man by the name of Prince Rurik came to rule the region of Novgorod. He brought with him many noble followers and a body of loyal Huskarls. According to the story, it is these men and those who followed in their footsteps to guard the leaders of the Rurikid dynasty who would eventually become known as the Drujina. In reality, however, it is highly likely that units of proto-Drujina already existed in some form. After all, the practice of powerful men surrounding themselves by retinues of elite household troops can be seen across the world and already had its seeds in the region as far back as the Germanic tribes of antiquity. That being said, there are certainly some distinguishing characteristics of the Drujina which made them stand out from their peers. We can begin in the years of their infancy. Some clues as to their role can be gleaned from the term Drujina itself. Coming from the root Drug, meaning friend, they were a prince's closest companions whose bonds were interpersonal and not bound by oaths of fealty or military service, as might be seen in the medieval West. The position was not hereditary, and a prince can invite anyone into his Drujina based on merit, skill, loyalty, or bravery. Likewise, these companions were free to refuse or to leave whenever they desired. They remained because they wanted to remain. In exchange, these men would often be fed, clothed, housed, and armed by their prince. One Arab visitor who encountered the Rus during this period reports the following, quote, Residing on a huge throne, together with 40 slave girls, the prince mounts his horse without ever touching the ground. 400 bravest companions live in his palace, men who die with him and kill themselves for him. This emphasis on their martial devotion was important. At this point, the Drujina acted primarily as a bodyguard to their prince and would function as the reliable armoured corps of his host in times of war. Yet, this was not their sole purpose. Naturally, such muscle men soon doubled as an enforcement and tax-gathering body for the various leaders of the Ruse principalities, which would emerge in the 10th century. These territories were loosely managed, had few defined borders, and were constantly feuding with their neighbours. In this environment, a ruler's authority only extended so far as they could actively enforce their will. The armed Drujina were thus the instrument of that will. Over time, however, the land of the Kievan Rus would become more organized and the role of the Drujina correspondingly became more complex and institutionalized. By the 11th century, each kainas, or prince, ruled over their Kainazestvo, or principality, with the help of a two-tiered Drujina. The senior Drujina consisted of the noble boyars and their closest retainers. These men were powerful figures in their own right, often from the aristocracy who filled the highest levels of a principality's administration. In combat, they acted much like the Drujina of old, representing the small but elite bodyguard of the prince. The junior Drujina, meanwhile, consisted of lesser nobles and elevated common folk. They were more numerous and thus could be found filling the lower rungs of power, both on the civil and military side. For instance, this group collected all the non-combat personnel into a more domestic retinue and were responsible for other essential things like logistics, civil administration and estate management. For our purposes, however, we will be more interested in their manifestation as a military unit. Let us therefore turn to a discussion of their equipment in battle. Owing to their role as the prince's bodyguards and enforcers, the Drujina were among the best armed warriors of the Rus. This armament would have been a reflection of their hybrid Norse, Slav and steppe heritage. In addition, such gear would have varied by location and time as different influences became more pronounced. For instance, the collapse of the Khazar Khaganate in the 10th century 
prompted many skilled craftsmen of Turkic and Mongolian origin to lend their services to the Rus. Expanded relations with the Byzantines too brought fresh waves of equipment imports and new practical and status-driven styles of gear. To a great extent, it would be up to the personal preference of a prince how he chose to equip his retainers. And it was up to each individual man how he might choose to further supplement or upgrade that gear. So, in short, there was little uniformity. That all being said, we can at least attempt to present a generalized view of what a Drugina warrior looked like. For starters, these men donned simple linen clothes with an overcoat and Mietelia cloak, often being added for additional padding and protection against the elements. Wealthier men made sure to display their riches on their person with jewelry, fine cloths, wolf pelts, bare fur cloaks, and marten trimmed capes. For defense, most of your rank and file warriors donned chest armor. In the early days, this may have begun with leather, but was soon upgraded to a short mail shirt, a long mail hauberk, or a scale cuirass. Officers and the more elite men seem to have been fond of wearing expensive imported Byzantine lamella armor, and in later periods even donned plate cuirasses. Limbs may also have been covered by shoulder, forearm, and leg armor of various kinds. The head, meanwhile, was covered by a helmet. Norse influence manifested in the form of the Yerman Bu style designs, while steppe influence manifested in the form of the high peaked nasal helm styles. Chain avantails were worn for added protection, and grave sites even leave evidence of impressive face masks. Lastly, a shield was worn. These were typically the circular-style Norse shield or the Byzantine-style kite shield. For offense, there were again many choices. Spears were your most basic weapon, owing to their relatively low cost and sheer practicality. Battle axes were also popular, especially among Varangians, with clubs and maces sometimes being used as anti-armor options. In addition, it seems that flails were fairly prevalent as large numbers of stone or iron flail heads have been found from the Kievan Rus period and battle locations. Swords, however, reigned as the premier status item. These might come as Norse longswords, Byzantine shortswords, or curved steppe sabers. For ranged combat, the Drugina could also be seen sporting javelins, composite bows, and later even crossbows. As we shall discuss shortly, the Drugina often fought mounted. In doing so, they acted in a similar manner to steppe troops. For the most part, this meant that they used little armor, maximizing speed and endurance for their hit and run tactics. However, there were certainly cases where they expected to engage at close quarters. As such, we find evidence of horses donning quilted cloth armor and chanfrons for protection. Elites, particularly in later periods, may also have added metal scale or lamellar armor for even better defense, as can be seen with their step peers. Thus equipped, let us now see how the individual Drugina were organized into a fighting force. Unfortunately, we have few sources explicitly calling out a command structure for the Drugina. This is likely a reflection of their overall small size and the flexible nature of such trusted forces who might morph into all manner of forms as their prince saw fit. We can, however, get some insight by looking at the general organizational trends of Rus armies at the time. These appear to have adopted the step practice of dividing troops based on a decimal system, at least so far as the naming convention goes. For example, the Sotsky theoretically commanded a hundred men, the Tzyatsky commanded a thousand, and the Vovodo commanded the whole army, which roughly numbered around 5,000, though that varied wildly. Filling out the higher ranks were all manner of other administrative positions, like the Konyushi, the Master of Horse, and the Podietsnoi, the Assistant Senior Officer. Members of a prince's drugina would likely have been spread out across a whole army to help command its various elements namely the bodyguard, the tribal militias, and the auxiliaries. 
Yet, it will also be important to note that allies and even foreign mercenaries might be entrusted with command. In any case, those Drugina not otherwise tied up with other duties would have been organized into combat units which could deploy for battle. As for the training and tactics, we again know little. Training in peacetime would likely have involved basic conditioning with everyday activities like travel, policing and hunting serving to hone their skills. Given the relatively high level of conflict in the region, actual combat was probably the greatest teacher. Here is how the 12th century text describes the Drugina who made ready for war under Prince Igor. Quote, and my men of Kursk are glorious warriors, swaddled under trumpets, cradled under helmets, nursed at the spear's point. To them, the roads are known and the valleys are familiar. Bent are their bows, open their quivers, sharpened their swords. When it came time for battle, the Drugina could take many forms and thus employ many tactics. In some cases, especially early on, or in the rough terrain of the Balkans, they took after their Huskal forebearers and deployed on foot. As such, they would likely be positioned in the main shield wall around the army standards. Here, they could make sure to shore up their own battle lines or sally out to break those of the enemy. Most of the time, especially when facing steppe foes, the Drugina would mount Armed with a bow, they could skirmish from the front and appear to have used the eastern shower of arrows approach to whittling down the enemy. Otherwise, they might be deployed as lancers on the wings of an army with orders to assault the flanks or repel enemy riders. Beyond this, we can expect them to have done as their prince commanded, be it a siege, ambush, raid or escort mission. With this theoretical understanding, let us now take a look at their service history. As we previously stated, this would have begun in the late 9th century as the Rurikid dynasty slowly forged their realm. At the time, this would have involved the prince leading regular campaigns against their neighbors to sort out the new pecking order. Here, the Drugina would have served as a roving band of musclemen meant to coerce rivals into submission. Occasionally, this may have devolved into skirmishing, raiding, or pitched battles. When a foe was bested, it was not uncommon for their retinue of followers to now join the victor. This would lead to a snowball effect of successful warlords rapidly growing in power. Yet, while they might be able to establish themselves as the big boss following some decisive campaign, the great distance of the realm and its fragmented nature meant that a prince's authority constantly had to be reasserted. This is why the Drugina proved so critical in their role as a roving manifestation of their lord's will. Under the first Grand Prince Rurik, this had mostly involved wrestling control of the lands around Novgorod. His successor Oleg then led campaigns to secure control of the territories around the Dnieper and eventually make Kiev his capital. Such affairs are only vaguely documented by our sources. For example, here is how the Primary Chronicle puts it, quote, The prince set forth taking with him many warriors from among the Varangians, the Chuts, the Slavs, the Merians, and all the Krivichians. He thus arrived with his Krivichians before Smolensk, captured the city and set up a garrison there. Thence he went on and captured Lübeck, where he also set up a garrison. He then came to the hills of Kiev, where we hid his warriors in the boats, left some others behind and went forward himself. He then sent messengers to the rulers of Kiev, representing himself as a stranger on his way to Greece on an errand for Oleg and requesting that they should come forth to greet them as members of their race. Askold and Deer straight away came forth. Then all the soldiery jumped out of the boats. They killed Askold and Deer, and after carrying them to the hill, they buried them there. According to legend, the Rus proved so confident in their conquests 
that they next rallied the defeated for a raid against Constantinople itself in 907 AD. While such tales are best taken with a grain of salt, they at least give us a sense of the skirmishes, ambushes and battles which must have taken place in these early campaigns. While the Drugina are not explicitly mentioned, we can safely assume that they took centre stage in such military matters. During the successive reigns of Igor, Olga and Sviatoslav, the Kievan Rus gradually consolidated control over their lands whilst waging ever more far-reaching campaigns against the neighbouring Balkans and Pontic steppe. Here and there, we hear of the Drugina taking part in the associated military and civil actions. For instance, they carried out Queen Olga's Red Wedding-style vengeance plot against the Drevlians, and are noted to have also helped her save the capital when it came under siege by the Pechenegs in 968. Between these grand events which make the history books, we must also imagine them riding out to keep the peace, collect taxes and serve as escorts for the ship and caravan convoys which were increasingly making their way across the land of the Rus. The situation for the Drugina would begin to change more rapidly with the turn of the 10th century. It is around this time that civil wars began to more routinely flare up amongst competing heirs. During such spats, the Drugina would play an important role as they took up arms for one faction or another. Here is how the Primary Chronicle describes one of the larger battles of the period. Quote, so, Yaroslav collected 1,000 Varangians and 40,000 other soldiers and marched against his brother. In response, Svyatopolk prepared an innumerable army of Ruses and Pechenegs and marched out toward Lübeck on one side of the Dnieper. But neither party dared attack. They remained thus face to face for three months. Then, after an exchange of taunts, Yaroslav marshaled his troops and crossed over at dawn. His forces disembarked on the shore and pushed their boats out from the bank. The two armies advanced to the attack and met upon the field. The carnage was terrible. Because of the lake, the Pechenegs could bring no aid, and Yaroslav's troops drove Zivatopolk with his followers toward it. When the latter went out upon the ice, it broke under them and Yaroslav began to win the upper hand. Sovyatopolk then fled among the Lyaks, while Yaroslav established himself as the victor. Another battle followed soon after and is described as follows. Quote, Sovyatopolk advanced with a large force of Pechenegh supporters and Yaroslav collected a multitude of soldiery and went forth against him to the Alta River. The two armies attacked, and the plain was covered with a multitude of soldiery of both forces. As the sun rose, they met in battle, and the carnage was terrible, such as had never before occurred in Rus. The soldiers fought hand to hand and slaughtered each other. Three times they clashed, so that the blood flowed in the valley. Toward evening, Yaroslav conquered, and Sviatopolk fled. As you can tell, details are sparse, and so we are left to imagine how the Drugina may have distinguished themselves in the thick of the action. Similarly, we must assume that they played a key role in the political and religious confrontations which divided the era. For instance, with Christianity on the rise, sources suggest that initially the Drugina served as a proud bastion of paganism, until it became more politically expedient to follow in the footsteps of Vladimir the Great, who had massed ranks of his men baptized in 988 AD. Yet, despite all of this turmoil, the Kievan Rus would rise to new heights under rulers such as Yaroslav the Wise. He helped further push the borders of the realm with wars against the Byzantines, Poles and Pechenegs, which were aimed primarily at gaining strategic control of the valuable trade routes through the region. The particular contest against the steppe tribes proved most hard fought and was likely a strong contributor to the increasing shift of the Drugina towards mounted combat. Following this golden age, 
the Kievan Rus slowly began to decline as they were weakened by a vicious cycle of internal and external attacks. The new reforms agreed upon by the Conference of Princes in 1097 helped regularize the transfer of power and avert bloody civil wars, but could do little to stop the gradual flow of power to the local level as the various minor princes capitalized on a weakening central authority to further empower themselves. By the 12th century, it proved common for these once minor rulers and their drugina to challenge the Grand Prince and his followers. This only further accelerated the fragmentation of the Kievan Rus Confederation, which had effectively disintegrated by the 13th century. This timing proved fatal as it coincided with the coming of the Mongols, who made their first appearance in 1223. In short order, the invaders led a brutal series of lightning campaigns which brought the already weakened lands of the Rus to their knees. Here is how the Pope's envoy en route to meet the great Khan reported on these affairs. Quote, the Mongols attacked Rus, where they made great havoc, destroying cities and fortresses and slaughtering men. And they laid siege to Kiev, the capital of Rus, after they had besieged the city for a long time, they took it and put the inhabitants to death. When we were journeying through that land, we came across countless skulls and bones of dead men lying about on the ground. Kiev had been a very large and thickly populated town, but now it has been reduced to almost nothing, for there are at the present time scarce 200 houses there, and the inhabitants are kept in complete slavery. The only Rus lands to escape this slaughter were those of the Novgorod Republic, which had wisely bent the knee upon witnessing the carnage wrought upon their brethren. Yet this was not the end of their troubles. The West had also been flexing its military might with the Fourth Crusade recently sacking the great city of Constantinople and the Northern Crusade now advancing upon the Baltic region. This campaign culminated at the Battle of Lake Papus on April 5th, 1242. It would be here that the mailed fist of the Teutonic Order would charge across the ice to smash into the assembled ranks of the Novgorod militias. According to our sources, quote, the brothers' banners were soon flying in the midst of the archers and the swords were heard cutting helmets apart. Many from both sides fell dead on the grass. However, it was now that the Drugina would charge out alongside their prince to hit the exhausted crusaders in the flank. The invaders would be forced back and, according to later legendary embellishment, were said to have drowned in the lake as the ice cracked beneath their panicked flight. This would be the last glorious roar of the unconquered Drugina. In the years to come, the idea of elite noble retinues would certainly persist, but the term fell out of use, and the nature of Russian forces will have evolved such that we will have to cover their story in future episodes. What units of history would you like to see covered next? Let us know in the comments below, and head over to our Patreon, where you can pick up the awesome art for this episode. A huge thanks to the researcher, writers and artists for making this episode possible and to the fans who fund the channel. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related episodes. See you in the next one.